Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode number 30 of Sir Kevin Says. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the month of October in which we did Friends Edition. That'll be back in December, so look forward to that. Today we feature Lil John Roberts. Super excited to have him on the show. We actually did this podcast through Zoom because he lives all the way out in Atlanta. And so we had to make it work. There were some minor kinks here and there, but overall I think the end result came out pretty well. So hopefully you guys enjoy it. Lil John is a world-renowned drummer, educator, and producer. He's been playing for Janet Jackson for over 20 years. He's also played for Stevie Wonder, Prince, BB and CC Winans, Music Soul Child, Quincy Jones, Anita Baker, Elton John, Neil, and a host of other artists that you can read about in his bio below. In this podcast, we discuss much of what he's been able to accomplish as a professional musician, an educator out in Atlanta, and a host of other things. Remember to subscribe, like, and comment. Share this video with your family and friends if you think it is beneficial for them. Also remember that this podcast is available on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and pretty much every other audio platform out there. Episode number 30, coming your way. Ladies and gentlemen, today is episode 30 of Sir Kevin Says. Super excited to feature Lil John Roberts. He is a drummer, producer, and educator. This is the first time we're doing the show through Zoom, so we'll see how it goes. Should go well. But, John, how's it going, brother? Man, I can't complain, man. It's blessed, man. Yeah? All is well? All is well, man. Even in the, in the midst of this pandemic, you know, things are yeah. still moving along, you know? Yeah, yeah. What have you been up to? Uh, well, since ever since March, there's been a lot of Zoom stuff like this. Yeah. There's been a lot of sessions, you know, either live here or like virtual with other people. Um, I even did a music camp during the, during the uh, COVID and everything. Like, so that, that really turned out really cool. I was very uh, pleased with how that turned out. So yeah. I just moved into a new home. So I'm wow. literally like still getting settled in my house right now. Nice, so it's man. been a lot. It's been that's a lot of cool. good things, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. That's good, man. So tell us a little bit about your journey, man. How did you get started in the music industry, your upbringings? Man, so I'm a church boy. I'm a PK. My dad's a pastor in Philly. So I started out playing drums. Like, you know, all my uncles in the family played. All my family are musicians. My dad played bass. My mom plays piano. All my aunts, they sing. You know, so five uncles that played drums. So wow. I was always around drums. Yeah. What age did you start at? Uh, technically 10. I mean, I was definitely brought into it at an early, earlier age, but I started really playing at 10. When did you figure out that you wanted to be a professional musician? At what age did that kind of start coming into play? That started coming into play around 15. Oh, wow. So at a very young age. Oh, yeah. Like even in like middle school, going into high school, I was gigging, like playing around town. I was playing with a group from high school that was uh, Mayor Good. Our, our mayor in Philadelphia was started hiring us to do all of his events. So we were getting paid, you know, middle school through high school as as his band, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> crazy, cool. man. That's awesome. Yeah. So we so, got a chance to figure out how to be professional at an early age, you know? Yeah. What are some things that you learned at a very young age that have helped you throughout your whole career as a drummer? Oh, man. The dedication your work ethic, um, you know, just everything that had to do with being a professional musician, I, I was exposed to it pretty early, and uh, which I'm grateful for because later on, it, it all made sense for me as far as being professional and handling business and everything outside of just being, you know, personality wise and yeah. you know, getting along with, with other musicians. Like I was always around musicians. So you know, we you know we have personalities. Musicians have personalities. Some are, <laughs> some are more stronger than others. You know, so yeah. you just learn how to maneuver with the different characters. I say, you know, right, right, right. Mm-hmm. How do you think you got discovered by other musicians that you wanted to work with? Like, how did you get into that circle or certain music directors you wanted to be surrounded by? Things of that nature. How did you get exposed to those individuals? Uh, one thing led to another. You know, I always say when I speak to people like. Uh, you know, it was like a timeline, how things happen. Like I started from one place and then next thing and next thing. 
it just all trickled and it was like a domino effect once yeah. one domino fell the rest of them kind of fell and it just you know went into a line but the first thing that really pushed me out there i was playing a lot of straight ahead in my earlier years yeah from from church into playing jazz i met went marcellus uh when i was 16. okay and, uh, he had a, a big part in like mentoring me and christian mcbride and joey d francesco we Man. were playing as a trio back in philly so he came and visited my school one time and we we took to each other, man. We became really cool. And, and then he reached out to my music director and said, hey, I want to use him for this Duke Ellington orchestra that he put together, youth orchestra. Yeah. And one, Like I said, one thing led to another. I got a scholarship to Berkeley after that. And then from there, things just yeah. started, you know, happening. And that was back in 1991, right? Yeah, exactly. Man, yeah. that's crazy. That's actually the year I was born, man. So... That's incredible. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> Just make me, I mean, you know, I got the grades here, so now I really feel old. <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't see it here, but I got one here too, somewhere around here, man. I just, I cut my hair often enough that nobody could ever tell, but they're coming in, man, lightly, but but they're there. Hey, man, that's, that's, a, that's a beautiful thing. You earned it, you know? That's wisdom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Being an educator yourself, right, and you've studied at Berkeley, what are some things that you would want to change about education for musicians if you could? What would I like to change educational-wise? Yeah. Or, or implement. For example, a lot of teachers that spend time teaching music theory and, and fundamentals in music and all these, you know, musicianship, stuff like that, mm -hmm. they don't talk enough about maybe once you enter the professional field, setting up invoices, taxes, stuff like that. Like, what would Ooh. you teach? Yeah, you meant you hit a big one, taxes. <laughs> I mean, the, the financial side of, of this business is a, is a big one, man. Like we're independent contractors pretty much, you know, yeah, we're not, right. we're not, we're not like technical employees of somebody We're we're independent, you know, entities. So you got to have that paper trail, you know, or, or things will go bad later on. Like, I mean, I learned the hard way. Like I had to make sure that all of my paper lined up with what I was doing because even like getting a home and things like that. Like they want to know where the money's coming from and, yeah, you know, yeah. they want to see receipts, you know, they need to right. see proof of, you know, you might be making a lot of money as a musician and just don't have a way to show it. Cause you might've been getting cash for a long time, mm, you know, yep. things like that, which we have done, gotten under the table and right. didn't have to pay taxes on those things. So later on, I realized it was like, man, I got to like account for every single <laughs> receipt, you know, yeah. wherever, the paper trail is I got to make sure that that's in place. So a lot of that I think could be uh, added into the educational side of, of the professionalism of being a musician. Like there should be a class yeah. talking about, you know, taxes and, 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 you know, how to save money and what to, how to invest the money. And, you know, cause we'll spend thousands and thousands of dollars and don't even realize, you know, until they comes and we're like, man, I don't have nothing to show for you know, my first tour, I went out with Janet Jackson. That was my first major tour, but wow. uh, I was on some other tours before that, you know, making some cool money for my age, you know, yeah. but the first tour I did with Janet, man, I came home and like half my money was already gone. And I was like, man. what happened? You know, I just, I had a good time, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I, you know, yeah, I had to pay for that later on. I was like, man, now I know like, yeah. You know, try to try to save your money on the road. Try to just live off your per diem during the week. You know, we right. get a per diem every exactly. day. Yeah. Uh, for, and matter of fact, they give it to you for the whole week. So it's like, what are you going to do with these, you know, six, seven hundred dollars, you know, of per diem, um, you know, to try to live off of that and, yeah. and leave your send your check home, you know, or send it into the account and don't touch. Try not to touch it. Try not to spend too much on the road. You know, we like, I love sneakers, you know, I like clothes, all that kind yeah. of stuff, you know? And, and I'm like, man, if I knew then what I know now, I would have tried to do things a little differently, but that's part of learning. That's part of growing up, man. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, man. You just mentioned right now, you've been playing for Janet Jackson for how long? Man, I was with Janet since 94. You've been playing with one of the biggest pop, female pop artists in the world. What's that experience like? I got the gig from the musicians that were in the band. Got uh, it. So Sam Sims, good friend of mine who lives in Atlanta with me here. Uh, Sonny Emery, all those guys like wow. those are like my big brothers. So I yeah. grew up knowing these guys and um, and they were all looking out for me. Kind of like what I do now with the younger ones after me. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we see who's doing what and it's like, oh man, we got to make sure that he's straight, you know, and 
That's you know, cool. We look out for each other like that. So those guys basically walked me into that gig, just Man. telling Janet and telling all the people about me. And, you know, I didn't have to audition or anything. All of this came off of the reputation that they heard and, and the, the connect with the being with knowing those guys. Yeah. Yeah. You know, That's yeah. awesome. So since 94, as your career has developed, what are some things that you've learned that you could say, man, aside from taxes, right? Uh, I, I wouldn't want to do this again. Or next time I'll be more careful to, to evaluate if this is a gig for me. Man, I can I can honestly say that my path has been very cool, man. Like I can't, I can't say I have that any regrets really, you know, things happen, you know, yeah. nothing's perfect. You know, I've dealt with different individuals in the past, you know, this, this business is very cutthroat. You yeah. Know, some people that smiling in your face, trying to take your gig behind your back, you know, like man. that just happens. It's the competition of, of, it's like, it's just like a sport, you know, yeah. the, somebody's trying to take the, the, the top man out, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it just comes yeah. with it. And that, and that goes for any instrument or any artist out here. You know, if, if there's a, a R and B artist, say Mary J Blige versus, you know, another girl that's like similar to her, you know, they trying to take each other out. They Somebody mm. wants the top tier, you know, Nicki yeah. Minaj versus Cardi B or, you know, like, <laughs> so like, you know, you got to understand that those things are going to happen as your career goes. You know, you're not going to always be the king of the throne. You know, yeah. there's going to be somebody that's going to try to dethrone you, yeah. you know, and that that's, that, that's just what happens. So, you know, I had to get used to, you know, thinking that uh, or not thinking that everybody have my best interest in mind. You know, yeah. And, yeah. and as you get older, you get more mature and you realize, OK, you know, not everybody is for me. You know, I got I, I got to be cool and still be a nice guy and cordial and all that kind of stuff. But be careful and, and be aware of, of the snakes in the grass. You know, man, that's so, good. Yeah. yeah. How has faith played a part in your journey as a musician as well? A huge part, man. I mean, even the fact that I'm not even mentioning the fact that I'm a PK, um, just um in general, you know, and I'm glad that I learned at an early age that this journey was not uh, just not my own, you know, this, this was something that God ordained from, from day one till now. Yeah. Um, and as I get older, I, I realize it even more and more, the spirituality that's connected with, you know, your path. And um, a lot of this stuff I wouldn't have been able to do if it wasn't for God, you know. Um, and, and then some of the people that have been in my life as well, that helped me get to the next level, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't me. I can't even say like, I did this, I did that. I did my part, you know, as far as, um, preparing myself and practicing like crazy and, and then just learning how to maneuver and, and move around in this business. Like you gotta be a good person in this business. There's a lot of people yeah. that aren't that are yeah. successful too, but that ain't going to last for too long. Right. And That's your good. reputation is everything, man. Like you could go back and say, man, I met John and he was cool. And oh man, he's such a nice guy. Or you could say the opposite, man, <laughs> John was a, was a jerk. And you know, he was super egotistical and man, I just didn't like his vibe. And that can change, that can make or break mm. the next thing that could happen for you. Yeah. You know, you don't got to be phony or anything like that. Just be cool. You know, right. it's so much easier to just be, a nice person and just be nice and be cool and yeah. get along with other people. Like people will hire you uh, before the other guy, just because of how you treated them, you know, how uh, you acted, yep. you know, your, your, your personality, your humility, those things can put you in, in situations quicker than somebody that has more talent than you a lot yeah. of times. Yeah. That's really good, man. That's really good. What about your influences? Talk about some of the people that continue to inspire you today or have influenced your career in a positive way. Oh man, I have so many uh, influences. I mean, starting from like early days, you know, seeing Jeff Tane Watts play with Winton when I met Winton and, you know, I'd hang around. He Every time he came to town, he would call me and be like, come sit behind the stage and watch him play. You know, that was my lesson was watching Tane. Man, watching yeah. Watching Hurl and Raleigh, you know, play, and you know, so those were my early inspirations. After my uncles, my uncles were first. Like one of my uncles was just amazing on drums. His name is David Roberts. He was actually uh, murdered, unfortunately, last oh, December before all of this stuff happened, which was very unfortunate. Um, but he's the one that I learned a lot of my style from. I wanted to be just like him. Um, my other uncle, Mark, he gave me my first drum set which I kept for till up till Berkeley. Um, matter of fact, 
Quest Love, you know, we grew up in Philly. All of us grew up playing in Philly together. And we were all in all city jazz band together. Uh, Amir Thompson, Quest Love, was playing drums along with me. Um, and, you know, I was swinging a little more than him. He was still more on the James Brown hip hop stuff like he does now. Right, um, right. But, you know, he was swinging too. But I had my drum set. And it was the Ludwig drum set that my my uncle had uh, given me. Yeah, blue streak, you know the old looking streaky <laughs> colored blue yeah, uh, man. Ludwig set. I took that all the way to Berkeley, and then um, our mayor saw me later on. I was like, man, whatever happened to that drum set you used to have? We were playing back in high school and all like that. I was like, man, I had to sell it because I needed some money while I was at Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got an endorsement, so I didn't have to pay for drums no more. So I was yeah. like, man, I'm gonna, I'll get some money from this drum set. If yeah. I knew then, oh my God, I Man. wouldn't have sold that drum set. Yeah. Cause it's amazing. Like it, it's worth a whole lot now. Like lovely yeah. drums are amazing drums anyway. Shouts out to Tama too. That's my company. But there you go. Everybody yeah. knows that Ludwig's has, has great drums just from yeah. Beatles days and all of the uh, early James Brown stuff, all that stuff. I, I believe it was played on Ludwig drums or Slingerland or they're very similar. But um, uh, yeah, I, I should have never sold that drum set, man. But man. Uh, you know, like I said, I had to eat. <laughs> I was on my own at that point, man. I didn't want to ask my mom and dad for much. So, yeah, I, I sold that to Jack's Drum Shop in in Boston. And uh, all my guys there, Johnny and uh, uh, oh, I forgot the other cast name. But Johnny works for Vader Sticks, who I also use, Vader Got Drum it. Sticks. Um, but he was in that, uh, that uh, drum shop. We used to always go over there, me, John Blackwell, Rest his soul. Um, and a lot of bunch of a lot of other drummers. Abe Laboriel Jr. was there when I was there. Um, we would all go over and hang out at Jack's in between classes and stuff, and just jam on the sets with them. That's amazing, like that, so. man. Talk a little bit about endorsements. That's probably one of the most important parts of a professional drummer, right? When you start playing for notable artists or start doing things in the industry, you start looking out for endorsements. Talk about how important that relationship is. I mean, that's the support for, for you, you know, like, I mean, man, you know, buying gear can, can get expensive, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, cymbals, like minor, I play minor cymbals, man. And I looked up a cymbal one day just to be curious, how much does this cymbal cost? I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it was like a house note. I was like, man, that's a mortgage right there, you know? Yeah. But, um, I mean, they make great stuff, but, you, you know, after a while, after you pay for so much gear, man, like, you're like, yo... Can I get some help? You know, can I get a yeah. percentage off or something? So it, it works hand in hand, almost like ball players with their sneakers and, you know, or Gatorade or whatever it is that they need mm -hmm. to help them, you know, perform better. You know, that's that's what those endorsements help you with. And you don't have to pay for them. Some of them write you checks to play their stuff or yeah. or use their gear or whatever. I'm still waiting for Nike to give me an endorsement <laughs> for wearing Jordans all these years. I'm like, come on, man. Y'all got to endorse some drummers. That's all yeah. drummers you wear right. is, is Jordans pretty right. much. They're comfortable. You know, like I could do a whole ad right now. Come on, Nike. <laughs> stop playing. Jordan, come on, man. Or what do you call it? A, a jump man. You know, Jump man, yeah, yeah, that's right. Man, that's right. Yeah, but I mean, seriously, like that would be a great campaign if they had a, a you know commercial with drummers playing and, and showing the sneakers because all of us wear you know fashionably first, and then we wear them because they're comfortable too. So you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's a whole pitch that I got there. Yeah, but but yeah, the endorsements come in and help a lot to save money for one thing, and um, you know, advertisement. You know, if I'm on the road with Janet, you know, and nobody knows it, they're like, who's playing with Janet? Like, they need to see that. So there's posters out, you know, well, it used to be. Matter of fact, I saw an old poster of me on a Sabian box. Uh, when I was moving, I, I, I saved my old Sabian box that I was the face of, you know. So I was the face of the uh, B8 uh, uh, symbol line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even though I don't play those, but hey, I was on a box, man. So I, I'll take it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, that was cool. Um, but things like that, that actually helps a lot with your with your journey, you know. Um, my electronics, you know, yeah. I, I go all the way back to drum cats and D drums and all like that for Janet. Like the first year I started with her, I had to come behind Jonathan Moffitt, who was already using electronics. Everything's electronic with that yeah. gig. So, you can, I mean, you could get by playing a, a, a acoustic kit, but it's not going to sound like the record. Right. You're going to sound like a club band, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> playing yeah. Janet songs at a club right. or something. So right. those electronics come in heavily because 
Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis produced the hell out of those tracks. And it don't sound like live drums. It's, it's mm. electronic stuff going on. But if you can implement both things with the acoustics and the electronics together, man, you're good to go. Yeah. So I don't know if you've seen any of my clips that I've posted in the past, you know, and I'm, I'm you hear me playing the kit, but you hear the electric sound. Yeah. Coming yep. Out. I've seen them on Instagram, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. Where you're playing, you know, you're using a lot of triggers, right? Did anybody teach you how to do that? Or is it something you just kind of learned on your own? I had to learn. I, I jumped, I literally jumped in on the drum seat and my the tech that was there that they had for me already, um, Craig Zarcos, he passed away. And uh, that was my boy, man. He, I learned a lot from Craig just from that first tour. I sat down and he said, okay, this is the gear that you're using, man. So this, I know you probably never used this before. So I'm going to help you walk through. I'm going to walk you through all of this stuff. Yeah. You know, because this, I mean, I, it was my drum set. I had Pearl back then, but they added the electronic stuff that Jonathan was using before me. Mm. So they were like, you know, this is what he's using on this song, this song. This is how you change the, the patches to go from one song to the next. So we were, we were changing the patches with a, with a pedal back then. Man. Now, now the technology is so crazy. Like we can go from one song to the next and on the Pro Tools or Ableton, it'll change the sounds for us now. So That's we don't have crazy. to we don't have to hit the pedals anymore. Like we we go in and rehearsal and say, this is where I want the electronic sound to change for this song, you know, and then this is where I want it to change on this song. So I just keep playing and the electronic sounds are changing through the show. <laughs> yeah, that's insane, <laughs> you know, but, man. Yeah, but I had to learn that stuff, man, on the spot. Like I had a few weeks before we had to go to Australia to do that second leg of her tour because they were already out. They had already done the States. And it's, they took a break and they were getting ready to do the whole European run. So that's when I came in. And during rehearsals, I mean, I was playing the grooves and everything, but I had to learn how to play the electronics Man. in rehearsal. Yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming when you're playing a certain part of the song, maybe you want to hit a ghost note. And when you're using triggers... Man, bro. No ghost notes. You can, <laughs> I mean, you can. Like, I, I even found a way later on to, to, to manipulate the uh, velocity. Yeah. So I could, you know, if I was playing like some little James Brown, something like, you know, I, I tuned it. I was well, not tuned it, but I, I made the, the, the setting to where I could, it wouldn't trigger while I'm playing. Oh, ah, I see. Got so it. So it would just get the big hits and the yeah. stuff in between would just be on, you know, but I had to, man, I had to manipulate the way yeah. that I played the, the, the snare, especially because, you know, sometimes we will play a, like a two, four groove and we'll just boom, pop. Right, and then sometimes we're playing like boom, yeah, you know. So the, some songs I couldn't play grace notes on at all because it just didn't make sense. You right, know? right, like uh, right. you know, if it's boom, 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 I just had to play that. Yeah. Nothing in between. Like some cats play a lot of ghost notes in between the snare, yeah. you know? Right, <laughs> right. To fill in the spaces. Yeah. 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 You don't have to do that on every song. So I, I realized that after a while. I was like, okay, this song, no grace notes. But if I did play grace notes like uh, Rhythm Nation, we are. So that's part of the groove anyway. Yeah. So. I just made sure that I tweaked the uh, the trigger so it wouldn't hit until I hit the big notes. Nice. Nice. That's cool, man. Oh, man. But, man, playing that stuff live, you really got to have some control because if you don't, it'll fire off. You know, you'll be... Man. And you got these big industrial snare sounds. <laughs> you know, and if you hitting more than one note, it's going to go... <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> has that it's ever like, actually happened when you perform it? Yeah, <laughs> I had to, I had to figure out my control. Like, no, no pun intended, but I had to actually figure out the control. Yeah, for those triggers, or the house is you. The house is the house. It's, whatever you're playing on the stage is coming out. You know, yeah. our sound engineer is amazing. Like Kyle Ham Hamilton, he was out there with us the last run I did. Yeah. And um, man, he had that stuff tweaked like to the T. So any little extra thing you could do is going to come out in the house. There was one time, matter of fact, uh, there's this big song at the end of the uh, show and the drums like, gah, gah, like, like super big samples. Right. So I'm chilling in between her verse. She's singing a verse. It's quiet. 
it's some strings playing, you know, everything is all quiet. Everybody's supposed to be like, still, I just happened to move. Like, oh no, I moved by accident and hit the rim of the snare. And Ooh. that's that's how sensitive the trigger was. So I, I go and I just tap the trigger. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, and then Janet looks over and is like, <laughs> and we were just cracking up, but she was in the middle of singing, and all of a sudden this gunshot goes off. Yeah. And she looked over, she was like, and she just kept going. We were all just like. <laughs> So I was like, I cannot be nowhere near the snare while she's singing her verse. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny, man. That's a that's amazing. Okay, so give us an example with the relationships that you've maintained with these artists that you've worked with, right? Do you try to maintain a friendship type of relationship with them? Is it a business type of relationship? How do you view that? What's your approach to that? It's a balance between both, man. Like, I mean, you don't want to go too far outside of your... You know, your welcome zone, you know, yeah, every artist, yeah. every artist has a different uh, boundary. You know, right. some artists are really tight with their band and we hanging out, we're doing the whole night. Like some, some artists I've worked with, that's what we do. We, it's a family, like, yeah, for real. Like, I mean, they call you during the week and stuff like that. Like when we're off the road or something, you know, but then there's some artists that's just straight business. You know, you come in, everybody's cool. It's nice. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Go to work. You know, mm. when the show's over, you don't see them until the next day. Right. You know, right. Um, through the years, I've gotten closer and closer with Jan. Um, you know, she doesn't call me, you know, that kind of stuff, unless it's something, you know, like that she needs to call me about business wise yeah. or whatever, which she's done in the past. Um, you know, like when she was changing bands and things like that, she called me to talk about the changes and, you know, just stuff like that. Um but then there's other artists where, like Queen Latifah, for instance, you know, yeah. we hang out, you know, like that's like my big sis, you know. Yeah. And um, and the vibe is just different. It, it just depends on the artist, though. When it comes to value, what's your approach to that? Well, I mean, for one thing, you need to know your worth for sure. You know, when you go, somebody calls you to do something with them. It could be on different levels. It could be like a really huge level or it could be something local or it could be something in the middle tier you know where it's like not huge money and it's not low money it's like middle money or whatever yeah like so that's what we're talking about like value wise as far as financially and stuff like yeah what what, what you feel like you should get for things and stuff like that mm -hmm. um i mean there's a gauge like i know where my gauge is as far as like how low i'll go for somebody you know how 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 much I'll charge someone on a bigger tier, you know, like, cause I know that it's a production and there's a budget there, you know, so yeah. you gotta like really pay attention to if I'm, am I playing stadiums? Am I playing arenas? Am right, I playing right. clubs? Like each, each level is different as far as the financial uh, aspect comes in. Even studio recordings, you know, I have a price that I'll charge a, a major record label. And then I have a price where I'll charge an independent label. And then there's a price where, you you know, your buddy wants to do something and, you know, or somebody that just reached out and said, hey, John, I don't have a lot of money. I know you're worth such, 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 but could yeah. you do this for this price? And, you know, and, and I, you know, a lot of times I look out for folks because, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it depends on how much work I got to do, too. Right. And, you know, right. you got to make sure that you're not give, giving too much of yourself and not getting enough in return. Yeah, you know, so I find out how to gauge those things too, and then sometimes it's it's, it's a barter situation. Like I might be playing on your record, and you might play on mine, and you might I might uh, do some extra stuff on yours. You sing on mine or something, yeah. like you know. That's and it, there's no money being exchanged there. It's really just you know the the relationship between us and helping each other out. Yeah, that's good, mm -hmm. man. That's good. Okay, so how about your approach to drumming? When you practice along to a metronome, what do you pay attention to? Uh, first is the tempo, because I'm really not focusing on the actual click, um, but I am. I'm using that as, you know, like when you go to a race uh, racetrack and you see a horse, the horse race running, that yeah. rabbit that's in the front, all of them are kind of following that rabbit. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and they're keeping the pace with that, but, but they're, not, they're trying not to fall too far behind the rabbit either. Uh, and then for me, I'm not trying to be too close to the rabbit either. Like it just <laughs> depends on the song, like a drummer, like Sonny Emery, who's a good friend of mine. I've, I've watched and studied for years, um, and even learned a lot from him as well. Uh, I noticed that Sonny plays right on top of the beat. 
that's his thing. You know, like mm-hmm. even with Earth, Wind, and Fire, he was pushing Earth, Wind, and Fire. That's I think that was one of the best drummers they've had in their band outside of Fred White because you know he was playing on a lot of that yeah. stuff. But but as far as like technicality and and like pushing the band, Sonny was the best at that. Um, and but I noticed his style was right on top of the beat. You know, it's like not falling off. And almost a little, not not too far ahead, but he'd be right on, you know. Yeah. There's some cats that kind of play a little behind the beat, you know, and that's just their style. It's a little more, you know, swervy and maybe right. a, a swinging and just a little behind, but it's not off, you know. And then there's some cats just straight off the click. Like, <laughs> they, the, <laughs> click is, the click is here and they're like... <laughs> No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, I treat the click like it's a per- piece of percussion. Like, you know, I treat that like, you know, if somebody was playing a cowbell right next to me and just grooving, you know. Um, but there's ways that I find it depends on the music, though. It really does. Like yeah, some yeah. stuff, we call it sloppy tracking, where you don't, per- you purposely don't play on top of the beat. You know, if the click is playing, you know, you're like, boot, got, boot, got. Yeah. You know, but the click is still moving, yeah. but you're not totally on it, you know? Right, right. It's, it's right. an art, man. Yeah. Would you say that's an example of like Neo Soul that's been really popularized in the last, I'd say, 10, 15 years? Absolutely. Chris Dave being one of them or Quest Love, that's, that's her style. You know, yeah, that's Amir a, uh, is like one of the best at that, I think, you know, in my opinion. As far as playing hip hop, especially, yeah. he knows how to manipulate the beat on top of a click, you know. And mm. he'll say to me, "He's like, man, I don't, you know, I don't really be paying attention to the click, or whatever. But <laughs> I know better, um, yeah. You know, he he man, he knows how to manipulate the beat, like just the sloppy track and the, you know, like the D'Angelo vibe that D'Angelo likes with the drums behind yeah. and everything else, exactly. Is, is, you know, or sometimes the drums are, are ahead and everything else is behind the drums, right." Right. It just right. depends on the song, yeah. man. Right. That's good, man. That's good. Do you have any other passions we don't know about? Right now, in this chapter of my life, I love teaching. You know, I love teaching the kids, especially because, you know, that's just a thing I like to see them progress. You know, like I have a few yeah. students here in Atlanta that are doing amazing. You know, like I've one of them has been with me for like three years, almost four years now. And I've seen his progression like way yeah. like. Wow, man, like I got an old video from one of our first lessons and I'm like, wow, you've come a long way. Now he's playing. He sounds soulful. He knows how to, man. he sounds really good on the tracks, you know, playing to the click and everything. I'm like, I take pride in that, man, seeing, you know, that I had uh, something to do with their development. That's good, you know, man. So, That's- I mean, Berkeley, I talked to Berkeley at one point. They asked me to possibly teach there. Um, and actually the year that they asked me, was it didn't happen and then Janet went out. So it actually worked out because I would have probably missed out on that tour. And that was probably my last tour that I would say, you know, because I'm really kind of over touring more so now, like, you know, yeah, traveling yeah. on the tour bus and the whole all that work that comes with touring and being away for months at a time and all like that. Like I'm kind of moving towards not doing that as much anymore. I like doing spot dates on the weekends come home, teach some, you know, play at my church or whatever. Like, you know, I'm yeah. really into that and still recording. I, I like love being in the studio more so than anything now. So, you know, it's just yeah. a different chapter in my life now. Yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about how important family is? Well, I learned better now than what I did when I was younger. Because when I was younger, it was just all about my career and everything. I had a son when I was uh, 19. So I, my first year of college you know, my son was born. So it was, mm. it wasn't easy, you know, especially being in college and then moving from Boston to Atlanta and immediately starting to go out on the road with all these groups. And you know, I was gone a lot, you know, so I, I regret uh, not being around for a, mm. a lot of those years, you know, for my son. But as I got older, I had a daughter, I had another daughter and, um, and my youngest son now, uh, who's 11, uh, Jet, um, so I try to just balance everything out as much as I can, man. Um, my yeah. oldest daughter's here in Atlanta. She's 23 now. Her name is Kalia. And, um, like I see her the most cause she's here. So, um, she just got a new apartment now. She's living by herself now. So she's grown, you know, <laughs> um, but you know, the, 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 uh, 
the communication is there and I'm just trying to like make things as tight as I can as far as being there when they need me. Yeah. You know? But yeah. but being a musician and traveling and all that kind of stuff and being a father at the same time is not an easy task. That's a yeah. very hard life to to balance out. And yeah. anybody will say the same thing like I'm not married or anything. So I I don't I don't live in the house with my kids or anything, but yeah. um, you know, like I said, it's just time management and just trying to carve out space in between the work, right. you know, and the distance that I am from my kids. You know, I got to go see them or my son's in Nashville, so he's close by. I can go there or he comes here. Um, but yeah, this is, you got to make it work however way you can. Yeah, that's good, man. That's great. What advice would you give to the beginner musician as they're starting their career? Um, I mean, go for it. Like, I mean, like there shouldn't be any boundaries of what you wouldn't do. Like whatever you need to do to get where you got to go, do it. You know, of course with, with integrity. Yeah. Um, yeah. But hard work, man. I mean, I see other cats sometimes I'm like, man, they, it seems like sometimes you see other people like working more than you, hmm. you know, it, it's, it's not up to you to really try to figure that out. You know, the, the biggest part is like, what am I doing? You know, I can't worry about what somebody else is doing, Yeah. you know, but I am inspired seeing people doing things like, you know, man, he's like doing that, he's doing that project, he's doing this, doing that. You know, it, it motivates me to like really push for what I'm doing. You know, sometimes maybe I'm not doing enough, you know, mm. and then I see somebody else doing something and I'm like, man, I, I need to like jump on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, the dedication means a lot, man. If you really want to be a, you know successful in this business you got to go hard man because there's somebody in the yeah. wings that's waiting to to have that that opportunity or be in your shoes like i said or be in that seat that you have yeah so never get too comfortable yeah would you say it was ever a goal of yours to become well known or famous in the music industry or is it something that you just accepted that it was just going to happen because you worked your butt off to achieve what you have already yeah, that's the latter. I, I I definitely wasn't really thinking about being famous and all that kind of stuff. I just wanted to be known for being a good drummer, you know, and, and, and being able to play different styles. That was my biggest thing. I want to be able to move in different circles and be able to, you know, fit in with the country artists or the pop yeah. artists or the jazz artists or R&B or, or funk or Latin or Brazilian. You know, like I, I wanted to be able to, if I got that call, John, do you know how to play a Brazilian, you know, beat or whatever, or, you know, Bahia, you know, play yeah. some rhythms like that? Uh, yeah, I know. Because I, I studied it, you know, right. and I've been around cats that are from Brazil or from, you know, Africa or from uh, 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 Australia or yeah. whatever, Jap Japan, you know, like every every style I tried to get close to the people that actually did it, you know, yeah. uh, Weedy Brema. He lives in New Orleans now, but... You know, that cat, man, yeah. like if you're a drummer, listening to him and learning his rhythms and stuff will change your playing. Like ask Nikki Glaspie, you know, ask Sput, uh, ask Sput, uh, 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 Robert C. Yeah, uh, see right. right. See right. Yeah. Um, um, who else has played with Weedy? A bunch of cats, you know, uh, I, Adam Deitch, you know, Adam went to Berkeley with me, matter of fact. Um, but all these guys have had a chance to, to play with, with Weedy or record with him and they they will all tell you that he will change your playing just because mm. of the rhythms that you learn that you can incorporate on the drum set. Yeah, he was doing something with an artist named Pedrito Martinez. He's from Cuba. Yeah, and dude, those two combined. Oh my gosh, that's yeah, it's just that's, insane. It's two different worlds. You yeah, know, you got Cuba mixed with Africa. You know, because right. I think I think uh, I think uh, Weedy is from Ghana. You know, oh, so wow. mixing. If I'm not mistaken, it's Ghana. Um, but he's from Africa. Um, but mixing those two styles together, yeah, the conversations that happen because it's right. all Afro-Cuban. Exactly, anyway, you know? exactly, um, exactly. Where are you from? Are you uh, Cuban? No, my family's from Peru, from Lima. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we man. have so like yeah. uh, 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 um, uh, oh. Alex Acuna. What's his name? Alex. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, oh, weather report. Alex. <laughs> I've been to his house, man. Alex is a great guy. Like he showed me some of his rhythms yeah. from, you know, from his country, you know. Um, so like people like that, Sheila E, you know, hanging out with Sheila, playing in her band. Yeah. I learned a lot. Cause Sheila, a lot of drummers came under Sheila's tutelage. You know, um, she showed them a lot of their style. Sonny, a lot of these cats learned a lot of their 
Latin rhythms and stuff like that on drums through Sheila. Wow. You know, Sheila, Sheila's the god. She's the goddess, man. She's the god mom. She's you know? amazing, man. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I always positioned myself around people like that. Dennis Chambers. Mm. Omar Hakim was a big influence in my life. Like I, I patterned my style after Omar. He's tall. You know, he had his cymbals high. Yeah. You know? So I was like, oh, man, he <laughs> looks like he's he's free. And, you know, he looks like he's just like a butterfly swinging at stuff, you know. And, you know, I, I loved his style and the fact that he plays so many different styles as well. And we became really good friends. He came to Atlanta one year and, you know, it was it was it was history after yeah. that. Like we've been friends ever since. Yeah. He was actually one of the people, too, that suggested that they um, hire me for Janet's gig as well. Wow, man. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about some of the highlights of your career? Yeah, well, one recent one was playing on Stevie Wonder's tour for Songs in the Key of Life. Oh man, uh, yeah, that was that was. I mean, uh, out of all the people I have worked with, man, he was one of them that I was like, "This is unbelievable!" Like I'm actually playing these songs that I listened to when I was a kid. You know, yeah. Uh, of course, Stanley Randolph is his is his regular drummer, right? Um, but they called me to come in and like play either double drums sometimes, or we both play different songs in the show. Um, I don't know what the reason was for that, but I'm glad they <laughs> thought about having two drummers. I was like, Stanley, I'm not here to try to take your gig because this is yours and you play it very well. Um, but I'm just coming in to enhance whatever way that they want me to do it. Um, or, you know, give my interpretation of the music, you know, which was an honor to me. Yeah. You know? So one night I was playing, man, and in my headphones, you know, my in-ears, I'm like, Stevie singing and I'm playing and I'm like, yo, almost had an out of body experience because <laughs> I'm listening to what the music was, but I'm actually playing it. Yeah. So I was like, whoa, <laughs> focus. Yeah. You're, you're playing this live. You're not just listening to it. Right, you know, right, right. <laughs> Amazing. But yeah, I had a moment like with Stevie like that, man, hearing him singing it in my ears. And I was like, this is crazy. Yeah. Uh, George Benson playing with George Benson. My dad used to listen to George Benson all the time when I was growing up. Like he used to work out in the basement and have like an eight track of, you know, breeze in playing or something like that. You know, and I was I would be on my drum set just kind of jamming to that. And then 30 years later, you to here play I am playing on stage with George. Yeah. You know, so it was real crazy, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, John, as we're wrapping up, one big thing I would say is very prevalent right now is mental health, right? And my question for you is through this pandemic, what are some things you do to alleviate maybe sometimes moments of discouragement or stress or how do you navigate through those moments? Man, meditation. Um, you know, I don't go too far away from the church, you know, because yeah. that's that's my upbringing. Um, I found myself just digging more into, you know, spiritual self uh, as far as like at church. You know, I'm glad that my church was actually functioning during this pandemic because we were doing we've been doing streaming services. So that not just going to play and, and get paid to play at my church or anything, but to actually hear the messages too every mm. week has helped me out. Yeah. You know, since February or since March. Um, uh, Cause you know, for a minute I wasn't like really heavy in the church as much as I used to, you know, I'm very picky about where I, uh, where I serve and where yeah. I go, you know, just in general. Yeah. I don't, even if I'm not playing there, just going to church, I'm very picky at where I go. You know, because spirits are spirits. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm very sensitive to that. Um, I, I got real heavy into my yoga practice. You know, I know it's kind of like one end to the <laughs> other, it's like church, and then you got the yoga thing over right. here. But you know, for me, I'm just stretching. Yeah, it doesn't have nothing to do with Buddhism or right. anything like that. Like right. yoga is a good way to release stress and, yeah. and stretch your body out. Because us as drummers, we hold a lot of stress in mm -hmm. our in our bodies and don't even realize we're walking around and ailments and aching and, and just playing through it man you gotta stretch bro yeah. like we are very this is a very physical instrument right you know we're we're the hardest working you know musician on stage as far as physically yeah um so pilates you know i got heavy in the pilates I, i've been doing pilates for years actually but the pandemic happened and i couldn't go to classes so i had to do it at home you know which kind of like sucks because you don't have that push as much when you go there and, and yeah. you're like in a room with other people doing it. Um, but yeah, a lot of those things, man, just, you know, talking to my friends more, um, checking on them, they checking on me means a lot. My family as well. 
you know, just we've, you know, found a way to just connect a little more than what we used to. Yeah. You know, because everybody's so busy. It's just like, right. You know, a text or something here and there. But then this pandemic forced you to to make time. Of course. People, you know. Yeah. And and pe- and people do the same for me. So I appreciate it. The people that reached out to me during this time and just, hey, I'm just checking on you because I know you your income. This is where you, you make, you know, the bulk of your money traveling and stuff. Um, so at one point I was like, yo, what's going to happen for Man. us? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I just, I'm just really grateful that God, you know, found other ways for me to still make an income during this, this crisis, you know, yeah. this is a, a huge crisis and it's still going on. So right, right. we don't, we don't know when we're going to be back on the road again or back on a real live stage with a full audience It's slowly trying to come back, but uh, I'm, I don't see it happening like right away. So yeah. Yeah. You know, we we found ways. This made you have to reinvent yourself. I called it reinvent the wheel. Yeah. Um, so I had to find other ways to like, you know, maintain what I do and, and ma- maintain an income as well. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, I was I was very fortunate to find ways to do that. So that's good, man. Uh, I, I'm very happy about that. <laughs> nice. Well, John, thank you so much for your time. And I know this is going to be super valuable for those that are watching, those that are hearing this podcast. Really appreciate you doing this all the way from Atlanta. Yeah, man. I just appreciate the fact that you took the time to do this. So, Man, no problem. This is episode number 30 with uh, Lil John Roberts. Thanks for watching, Sir Kevin Says. And see you guys next week.